go back to the front of the for a second. Uh, are you listening to me? Are you listening to me down there? Do I use the microphone? It's are you you're good? Yes? Okay. Uh, in 2004, Professor Rojas, who teaches in the Romance Language Department, uh, I will be there, in the Romance Language Department, and uh, these interesting issues of uh, feminist theory and Latin American uh, women writers, a published number of articles, etc. She delivered Paul Gates Convocation Alice for the 2008 <coughs> students. She said back then that as you begin your life at Paul Gates, you will be asking yourself questions of sexual orientation, of political leanings, of racial and ethnic nature, of the meaning of life, of your place in the world. There will be, she added, also questions that will lead to perhaps to more acute awareness of class, racial, racial and cultural differences, and questions of how you want to relate to those differences, and how to enrich your life because of those very differences. And we are here today with the last lecture and we're trying to foster this kind of understanding, this kind of questioning and this kind of bringing about ideas and insights into issues of race and gender. Um, the last lectures are part of the LSD program um, at Colgate University. Uh, LSD program is an interdisciplinary program for those of you who are not aware of this interdisciplinary program. We have two major concentrations in African American studies and Latin American studies, and we have four minors as well African American studies, Latin American studies, and Caribbean studies. So the both lectures were established in 1998. And we recognize persons of outstanding achievement who have contributed to our better understanding of African and Latin American life, history, and culture. They provide our community, these lectures, provide our community with ideas and insight that help us to come to grips um, with the community dilemmas surrounding race and gender in the United States, America, and the world. I use the term America to refer to the Western countries. Um, and they help us answering this kind of questions that Professor Robert mentioned. Two years ago, uh, in your own um, lecture. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Rojas. Cobre, 
1994, the Universidad Autónoma de México published an anthology of her stories uh, entitled Hot Stories. Other collections have been edited in England, Italy, and Germany. <coughs> I just learned today that her collaborator and husband uh, helped with the, actually did the translation of one of the most fascinating but challenging short stories that she wrote from the point of view of the linguistic art history that she displayed. And he said, you know, it was a challenging job <laughs> to translate that into French, uh, even with her help. And Alidia's stories have been featured in numerous magazines and in international anthologies. She's been translated into several languages, and she has won her honors such as Casa de las Americas and the Juan Rufo Awards, and also scholarships from the prestigious Guggenheim Foundation. She has also a, a, a great, a regularity exercised commentary journalism as a columnist in the newspaper El Nuevo Día, uh, in the weekly Claridad, uh, and also in the monthly publication Dialogo. Dialogue. The collections of El Tramo Angla, Waiting for Lolo, and Other Generation of Illusions, as well as her new book, Mirada de Doble Filo, Double Edge Look, offer a broad sample of her incisive article in <coughs> current affairs. The literary critic Carmen Dolores Hernandez uh, had this to say about uh, her latest book, Double Edge Look, and I quote, Ana Lidia Vega has developed a distinct style of journalism <coughs> with a resounding impact, end quote. Uh, the distinguished writer, Luis Rafael Sanchez, also said uh, that this is really a necessary book. And he also uh, insists that it, and I quote, it maintains the expressive rigor of <coughs> the lucidity, page after page, under the support of the book, an impeccable and a very energetic prose. Uh, I think those, those words apply very much to her writing, uh, uh, very energetic, very lucid, and an excellent critic as well as an excellent writer. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and privilege <coughs> to present to Colgate University a great writer from the Caribbean, Ana Lidia Vega. in my life. 
Needless to say, my own work as a writer was greatly enriched by that discovery. Here now comes the missing link between my personal story and Mr. William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois. Published in 1903, his groundbreaking book, The Souls of Black Folk, is a study in the sociology and psychology of the oppressed, which came long before the theories of Aimé Césaire, Hans Fanon, and Albert In its revelation of the social and mental repercussions of racism and oppression, it constitutes indispensable reading material for any student of Latin American and Caribbean history. I could have certainly chosen to do another type of reading, a reading mostly for entertainment purposes. Since this is a department of Africana and Latin American studies, in a country which, according to the latest polls, is probably about <coughs> to have its first black president, I thought it would be more than pertinent to present a literary dialogue between some selections from my work and some of Du Bois's ideas. We will hopefully all begin to measure the expanse of common ground there is between a writer from a U.S. territory in the Caribbean at the beginning of the 21st century and a black American scholar at the beginning of the 20th. The title of this reading is a direct quotation from Du Bois. In part, one of the songs of Black Folk, he describes the harsh realities of racial segregation. Between me and the other world, he says, there is, ne there is ever an unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly finding it. He then goes on to say that people ask him all sorts of things except the real, the essential question to be asked of a black man in America. And that question is, how does it feel to be a problem? That's a quote from Du Bois. As a Puerto Rican writer visiting at a prestigious American university, it occurred to me that I should address that question, which, if not answered, <coughs> is at least explored in some of my stories and essays. I have taken three main ideas from the Souls of Black Folk and have chosen selections from my own <coughs> work that are convergent with those ideas. Convergence, however, is not forced unanimity. Sometimes there is also some degree of divergence. And most of all, an application and elaboration of those ideas to my own reality as a writer from a place with its own particular colonial history. But in all cases, the excerpts I will read underscore the validity, profoundness, and relevance of Du Bois's thought. In that sense, they are my homage to the man to whom this, to whom this lecture series pays tribute. I will now begin my reading each text will be introduced by a quotation from Du Bois. Please keep in mind that I will not be reading complete words, but only brief passages from longer texts I have written, all in Spanish, but I will read from the translation. Okay, part one of the reading is called Behind the Veil. The veil is a <coughs> concept that Du Bois develops in the souls of black folk. In order to portray the experience of being black in America at the beginning of the last century, Du Bois creates one of his most powerful images of isolation. Describing a traumatic childhood incident, he says, it dawned on me that I was different from the others, or alike maybe in heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world by a vast veil. The metaphor is a complex and a paradoxical one. The veil is transparent enough to allow him to see through it, but it is sufficiently thick to keep him separated from that visible yet unattainable world beyond the veil. To those standing on the other side, however, the veil is totally opaque. They cannot see, 
those who are shut out from their own privileged world. Written in Spanish and translated into English by Andrew Hurley, my short novel, Miss Florence's Trunk, El Baúl de Miss Florence, attempts to portray life on both sides of the veil in a 19th century Puerto Rican sugarcane plantation. Miss Florence, the main character, travels from England to the Caribbean to become the governess of the plantation owner's only son. This is based on a real life story. The only son was the um, grandson of Samuel Morse, the inventor of the telegraph. But his daughter, Susan, lived in Puerto Rico for 40 years, and they had a plantation with slaves. That's a, 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 a Morse used to defend slavery, saying it was uh, ordained by divine <coughs> presidents. So that's the dark side of Samuel Morse. Okay. Um, the main character travels from England to the Caribbean to become the governess of the plantation owner's only son. She is quite cultivated, but totally ignorant of the harsh realities of slavery, which have made her employer a rich man. In that sense, she too lives behind the veil. One day, she goes out for a walk with a friend, with a friend of hers, a French doctor who happens to be an abolitionist. In the following passage, Miss Florence is in for a big shock. Her protective veil will be torn down rather abruptly by a surprise encounter. This is how Miss Florence, uh, this is now Miss Florence speaking in her own voice. So here's Miss Florence. For my solitary walks, I had always obeyed Miss Susan's admonitions and never penetrated the hedge of vines and taken the path to the Negro quarters. The Vate, as Charlie calls the little earthen plaza around which the Negroes' rude houses are built. I had always chosen the other path, which leads through a strand of extraordinarily tall and graceful palm trees down to the very edge of the ocean. This day, however, at a little past six o'clock in the evening, as dusk was coming on, we took, at Renee's urging, a shortcut back to the house, and the path led us directly through the area of the Negro's dwellings. Under the pretext of weariness, my companion chose to enter that inhospitable and foul-smelling place about whose true life I knew nothing but the echoes of voices and of drums wafted to me on the wind on certain nights. Renee's words, previously soft and melodious, as he revealed to me his deepest emotions, now were strangely hard. All tenderness had fled his eyes, which looked upon me fixedly with no flicker of a wink. It's curious that they are not called by their true names, slaves. <coughs> it is as though we insisted upon denying their real condition, as though if, if we can but avoid naming it, we may allow ourselves to be blind <coughs> to the true horror of their state. But what are they if not slaves? They work in the fields from sun to sun. They live like beasts, one atop another, locked into these wretched hovels. They suffer punishments to their flesh that would shame the barbarians. They come, they go, they breathe to a rhythm set them by our mere wills. We had paused by the side of the road. The harsh expression on my companion's face disturbed me. I opened my mouth to say that I wished to go on toward the hacienda, but I closed it again upon seeing that Rene had turned on his heel and was attentively gazing into the green wall, the green black wall of sugarcane encircling the bate. As though in response to his gaze, a long cortege of ragged men and women, their bare feet covered with mud, stumbling in the clumsiness of exhaustion, began to file slowly towards us. My heart beat violently in my breast. I raised my gaze to my companion's face my eyes pleading for an answer to this spectacle. Look at them. Look well, Florence, he said, bringing his lips down to my ear, so close I could feel his breath. 
These are the men and women who give the sleepless to our coffee. My eyes clung fatally to those emaciated torsos, those scarred backs, those grim and hostile countenances that look like faces issued from some dark cavern in the bowels of hell. Eager to erase the painful ugliness of that scene, which the failing light of evening invested with a spectral glow, I quickened my steps along the trail back to the house. Rene followed, but we spoke not a single word to each other until, until we were once again inside the magic circle of the targets. That's a short passage from Miss Florence's <coughs> talk. To illustrate the living behind the veil on both sides of the veil. All right, uh, now part two is called on the concept of two-ness, two-ness. In his psychological study of race relations, black skins, white masks, Constantin, one of the great philosophers of decolonization, spoke of the black man's discovery of himself as object of the white man's gaze. Almost 50 years before, before Fanon, W.E.B. Du Bois had introduced the concept of the black person's two-ness, being two in one, which he described as a double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of other, others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused, content, and pity. That's a quotation from Du Bois. I will now read you a short extract from a parodic fairy tale. That means to be funny. I, I hope it works. Uh, I wrote it a long time ago. The title of the story is Pateco's Little Prank, Otra Hanjat de Pateco, and it was translated by Carol Wallace. It is also set in a 19th century plantation <laughs> and portrays a rather extreme case of Tunis, the life of Jose Clemente, a child who was born with a black head and a white body. In this passage, there are some allusions to the Afro-Caribbean gods, Chango, Chango, Ogu, Ochu, Obatala, which here replaced the Western mythology of fairies and magicians. Okay, here it goes. I'll just read a short extract because it's a long story. And if you want to find out the ending, you have to buy the book. <laughs> Pateco's little prank. The Monteros were the masters of a prosperous sugarcane plantation. Twenty-five black slaves worked themselves to death from sunup to sundown, <coughs> flattened the bellies and the purses of the family. The enormous house of the Monteros rose up ever higher, wider, and prouder over the tassels of the cane fields. Pateco pata de cabo always a mischievous prankster, wanted to play a big joke on the Monteros. Pateco in the, in the Puerto Rican tradition is a sort of devil, a devil, an imp. Uh, he wanted to play a joke on the Monteros, and with the approval of the African gods, he stuck his cloven goat's hoof in India ink, powdered it with wheat flour, and sang in a tuneless voice. Stride and sack, sack and stride, white and black, black and white. Okay. Get that monster out of here, bellowed Doña Amalia Montero, turning pale at the sight of that thing which after nine months of misery was kicking happily at her side. And she became whiter than Snow White when the midwife assured her that indeed her legitimate and long-awaited firstborn but through one of life's mysterious tricks had been born with a white body and a black head. Needless to say, the mother refused to believe it. What possible relation could this two-color beast have to her lily white flesh, golden tresses, and bluer than blue blood inherited from old Castile? What would the aristocratic ladies and distinguished gentlemen of pure European lineage say at the, christening, at the christening of this very exotic newborn. The fat rat of doubt gnawed 
tirelessly away at the heart of Don Felipe Montero, the husband. One rainy night, he ordered Cristobal, one of the slaves, to take the incriminating infant and abandon it on the mountain to the mercy of the elements. But Cristobal, as usually happens in such tales, took pity on the child and saved its life, leaving it to the care of a healing woman named Mama Ochu. Mama Ochu lived in a humble little shack on the banks of the, of the river Plata. There, she took charge of the baby, nursed him and dressed him as well as she could in her poverty. As soon as the child was old enough to understand, his guardian said to him, you will be called Jose Clemente, and you will not leave this house without my permission. Outside these walls, evil roams. Enclosed in the shack, ignorant of the world, Jose Clemente watched the days pass without distinguishing them from the nights. The stories Mama Ochu told him, stories of Pateco, Calponte, and the Great Beast, of Juan Calalú and the Princess Moribibi, were his only distraction. Those are all um, fairy stories from the, from the Caribbean. But soon, the child's curiosity and thirst for life had grown such that one day he asked the old curandera very respectfully, why am I white and you black, Mama Ochu? Frightened, Mama Ochu crossed herself three times and once in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> there were no mirrors in the house, and the child, who had only seen his body and not his head, believed in his absolute whiteness. Mama Ochu did not know how to tell him the truth, and to avoid causing him pain, she burst out, because that was the will of the Lord Almighty Chango. The child seemed to be content with that explanation. Perhaps he was. Time went by and Mama Ochu went along, secure in the belief that the storm had passed, until one day it circled back with renewed force. Mama Ochu, what color are my eyes? Blue as the river, like the poor old woman, asking Chango's forgiveness for such a sacrilege. And my hair, Mama Ochu, yellow as the sun. That was when Jose Clemente truly began to wish to meet the river, to know the sun, and to discover his own face. But his guardian reminded him that evil walked freely in the countryside, and the poor little thing continued to ferment fantasies in the still of his clandestine dreams. The years galloped by. Jose Clemente was a tall, strong boy. His curiosity had grown with his body. One day, when Mama Ochu was out and about looking for wood for the fire, a very suspicious gust of wind suddenly opened the window, and the world, the river, and the sun were born. And something else, because in that blessed instant, as if by coincidence, a young slave girl chanced to pass by. She was a girl of such bewitching beauty that she would have made the Mbandumba of faraway Kimbamba burst with envy. She was coming to bathe in the river and was about to take off her petticoat. This is a sexy part. <laughs> when Jose Clemente, who was struck stupid at the sight of her, asked innocently, are you the Princess Moribibi? Seeing the black head on the white body framed in the window, Maria Lao, for the beauty was graced with that name, was so frightened that she turned and ran, thinking that she had encountered the very devil Pateco or something far worse. Without a moment's hesitation, Jose Clemente jumped down from the window and pursued her for a stretch, but lighter than a kite in March, the girl disappeared. In an agony of love, Jose Clemente threw himself down to cry next to the river. That was how he came to see himself for the first time. That was how he learned that he had neither blue eyes nor yellow hair, and he cried even more bitterly. He cried so much and so long that the river rose, the waters turned in an unexpected whirlpool, and from them surged the big, strong, black body of the god or womb 
In Caribbean mythology, Ogun is the god of fire and war. Ogun wrapped in a wave of fire with the red bandana on his head and the machete shining at his waist. Don't cry, Jose Clemente, said the apparition in a booming voice. The boy fell on all fours. Mama Uchu had taught him to respect his elder and his gods. He didn't dare to even lift his head from the ground. Ogun is not pleased with tears, thundered the vision. Stop crying. Oh, Papa Ogun, whimpered Jose Clemente. Look how unfortunate I am. Help me to find the princess, Moribibi. Ogun let out a burst of laughter that shook the mountains of the central range. This is not a land of princesses, he said, his belly swollen with laughter. Then at least return my collar, said the boy, blushing a little in the face of Ogun's ridicule. The god became serious, and then he resounded as sharply as a drum. <coughs> your true collar is among your own. You will not be two when you are one. And handing the boy his machete, he faded away to where he had come from. Rest of the story is up to you. <laughs> well, so much for Tunis. <laughs> then um, the third text, third, third party spot through the eyes of others. And that's also a quotation from the book. It is now time to expand the, double, the concept of double consciousness according to the boy to extend its reach and its depth so that it may include the conflicting self-perceptions that not only blacks, but all subjects of social, cultural, and political subordination may experience when, in Du Bois' words, they look at themselves through the eyes of others. Here we leave the 19th century behind and move on to the middle of the 20th. In the following passage from a testimonial essay called Meet the New Yorkers, Saludo a los New Yorkers. That's how we, uh, we call in Puerto Rico uh, uh, Puerto Ricans born in New York. New Yorkers. Well, it's not pejorative, it's generic. I entered the confusing maze of mirrors of Puerto Rican migration to the United States while describing my New York's cousin first visit to the island. Her parent, to the island her parents had left when she was only a baby. Let's see how she is seen, and Puerto Ricans are seen, and New Yorkans are seen, and I myself am seen through the eyes of others. Okay. My. My very first contact with that exotic species called the New Yorkers came during the late 50s when my cousin Carmen flew into my parents' house in Puerto Rico like an unannounced hurricane from the north and said she would be staying for a, with us for a whole month. After handing out gifts and kisses to everybody down here from everybody up there, she slipped into her one-piece red and white Esther Williams swimsuit and stretched out in the middle of our garden, legs wide open and pale skin hungry for some long lost tropical sun. My mother was in total shock, but said nothing until my father came home at noon and saw her, all covered on shine and tan, talking to the neighbors who had come, all come out to get a look at the first live sex symbol in their very sheltered lives. My father, of course, almost had a stroke, but said nothing until my cousin grabbed my bicycle and went riding around the neighborhood, yes, still in her swimsuit. <laughs> but that was not the only blow to Puerto Rican tradition that Carmen innocently inflicted on our family. Some days later, she had the nerve to go out all alone for a walk in the city to my sister's profound envy since she had never known such wicked pleasures reserved exclusively for men. Keep in mind, that was in the 50s. <laughs> the night, Carmen came out of the bedroom, all dressed up, high heels and makeup, and said quite casual, casually that she was going out on a date with a guy she had met at the bus stop. <laughs> Civil war broke out in our living room. The next day, she was quietly sent to my grandmother's house 
house in the south of the island where she was temporarily saved from eternal damnation by that stern Puerto Rican version of Bernarda Alba. <laughs> Carmen was definitely the first liberated woman I ever met, even if in the, in the 50s a less flattering term was used to describe that condition. <laughs> when she finally had to cut short her vacation and go back to New York for the sake of our family stability, I missed her very much. She went away in a fury, swearing that if she ever came back to the island, she would stay at a hotel, and even if she had to work nights at 42nd Street to pay for it. <laughs> New Yorkers came back to my life in the strangest way, through a movie, West Side Story. That was a big hit among the children of my neighborhood. We all bought the soundtrack record and tried to sing and dance like Rita Moreno. A boy like that who killed your brother, forget that boy and find another and stick to your own mind. But I still remember the people protesting in front, on front of the Matienzo Theater and screaming out against the allegedly negative image of Puerto Ricans that Hollywood was letting loose through the musical. Indignation ring. What vulgarity, Dios mio! Those gringos must believe there's nothing but street gangs down here. And thank God Natalie Wood had saved the national honor with her straight hair and Greek profile. <laughs> I, really, I really could not understand what the fuss was all about. Years later, though, I discovered that the film's international success had put Puerto Rico on the world map. When, during the late 60s, I went to France as a graduate student, my French friends, who could not tell Puerto Rico from Costa Rica nor Haiti from Tahiti, <laughs> recently with the dubious nickname Mademoiselle Westside Story, <laughs> in some kind of poetic justice for the New Yorkers. I was 13 when I first set foot in New York. My mother had to undergo a near operation, and I stayed, of course, at my cousin Carmen's home in the Bronx. She had married an American airline pilot, and the scandalous prestige of olden days was now a thing of the past. As a housewife, she had sobered up considerably. The year was 1960, and Puerto Ricanness was still very much in the closet in New York City. In order to survive in that urban jungle, Carmen had told everybody that she was Spanish and advised me to do the same. Be a good girl, she told me every day before leaving for work. Remember, we have to prove that not, not all Puerto Ricans are thieves and junkies. <laughs> Those apocalyptic words impressed me deeply. For the first time in my life, I was experiencing, and experiencing the sinfulness, the uh, wrongness of my identity. I felt pretty much as if I were in an orphanage, trying very, very hard to be adopted. But there was worse. Not only was I supposed to redeem my fellow countrymen from flattering image, but also to politely smile and graciously accept all kinds of poisonous compliments a la, you certainly don't look Puerto Rican, and you could pass for Italian. <laughs> that, would, that would be showered upon me as a reward for my good behavior. Believe me, that first day in New York was really mind-boggling. Luckily for me, I also had a brief but intense romance with my dashing New Yorkian cousin, Billy Santana, which was conducted entirely in Spanish. That sentimental interlude saved my life during the long cold summer I spent in the melting pot. <laughs> that was uh, through the eyes of others. Now, <clears throat> to the eyes of others, this part is called In the Islands of the Sea. And this is the part where there is a slight divergence from uh, Du Bois' uh, book. Because here I speak about language. And obviously for Du Bois that was not an, an issue because he spoke English. And he was, and, and he was living in an English-speaking country. But I'm from a US, a U.S. territory in the Caribbean that is Spanish-speaking. So Spanish is also a cultural and political issue uh, that I introduce here through um, my making the relationship with Du Bois thought. The Islands of the Sea. In the souls of black folk, Du Bois went far beyond the situation of black people in America. He elaborated on the subject of diversity in a universal sense 
as he wrote about what he believed to be the main cultural issue of the past century. Here is what he said. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia, in Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea. That's where he includes us. <laughs> this, as we all know, was a prophetic statement since the color line continues to generate conflict in the 21st century. The war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the wall that is being built along the Mexican-American frontier are eloquent examples of that extended ethnic, cultural, economic, and political confrontation. I was quick to note that Du Bois had included what he called the islands of the sea, as he calls them, in his global view of the deadly relations between the dominant and the dominated cultures of the world. Almost a half century later, as a member in the Council of African Affairs, he took a very active stance against colonialism and expanded his views of that subject. I would now like to touch upon a derivative theme, yet another type of cultural confrontation that for obvious reasons Du Bois did not describe in his book. Throughout history, language has always been an instrument of domination. In his portrait of the colonized, a classic work on the psychology of the oppressed, Tunisian writer Albert Memmi characterized colonial bilingualism as a true linguistic drama. He wrote about a face-off between two symbolic universes represented and transmitted by two languages, the language of the colonizer and the language of the colonized. As a Puerto Rican whose native language is Spanish, this is a subject which is close to my heart. During the first half of the 20th century, Big stick U.S. colonial policy in Puerto Rico included imposing English as the language of public education. This policy met with a firm and even heroic resistance by Puerto Rican public school teachers. In 1948, after so many failed efforts to civilize us in English, Spanish was declared the official language of public education. So for almost 50 years, uh, Puerto, Ricans, Puerto Ricans in public schools had to study all subjects in, in English. And after 48, then Spanish came in as the language of education. The following excerpt is from another testimonial essay called Struggling with the Difficult One. Pulseando con el difícil. Because in Puerto Rico, we call English the difficult one, the difícil. Oh, you have, to, you have to speak at this conference. Oh, are you going to do it in Spanish or in el difícil? <laughs> so, uh, the essay has a boxing match structure. It presents my ideas in two rounds. The first round deals with my own personal experience while learning English in an Irish-American Catholic school in a Spanish-speaking U.S. territory. The second round deals, uh, tells about my recuperation of Spanish and my reconciliation with English after a hard-fought ideological battle that Du Bois would have fully understood. I will now read you part of the first round, learning English in the Irish American Catholic School, where English and, and uh, Catholicism were part of the same religion. Okay, oh, here it is. Struggling with the difficult one. Having been born in the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico, a country that has always been under foreign domination, first by Spain and currently by the United States of America, I have had a very incestuous relationship with most languages ever since I learned to speak. Spanish, of course, is my native tongue, the one that, that was always spoken at home, the one in which I express my innermost feelings and thoughts. English, on the other hand, was the language I learned in the Catholic school I attended, which was run by Irish-American nuns. It thus became the vehicle of my grade school and high school education, the language I did most of my reading in all throughout my formative years. The process of learning English in a colonial society such as Puerto Rico was anything but simple. Nevertheless, the nuns at my school set themselves enthusiastically to the impossible task of converting us into nice little American citizens. Each morning we piously sang the O Say Can You See Gospel song, and we pledged allegiance to the flag of the American Union, better known in the island as La Pecosa, 
freckle face because of the many stars. <laughs> <laughs> English was, of course, the language all our classes were conducted in. We had to speak it at all times, even to seek permission to go to the restroom, or else face ridicule by wearing our pants in public. Is it then surprising that we, the spoiled children of U.S. colonialism, developed from childhood to adolescence a passionate and conflictive love-hate relationship with the language our people have prisoned in fearful and reverent awe in the easy, the difficult world? When third grade came around, we had already mastered the Pavlovian reflexes of basic English that would help us survive the non-dictatorship. Important textbooks and attitudes were rapidly creating in our little heads an alien world distinctly separate from the one we live <coughs> at home. Talk about veils. In my family's wooden Santurce house, my father, a self-taught country poet, improvised verses in Spanish and would not even let us call him papi because it sounded too much like English to his purest ear. At school, on the other hand, it was absolutely forbidden to lapse into Spanish whenever some elusive English word escaped our memory. Little by little, English was gaining in our eyes the prestige of a code that stood for progress and modernity, while Spanish was more and more relegated to the spheres of the intimate and the domestic. I, I guess that must also be the relationship between Creole and French in the you know, uh, French Caribbean. But the most insidious thing of all was rather the double standard that had been subtly infiltrated into our circulatory system. We were profoundly and of course unconsciously convinced that English would give us access to the great conquest of Western civilization, while Spanish tied us irremediably to backwardness and vulgarity. It was an intimate conviction, like that of the existence of God, which, had, which was never questioned or even put into words. English was, like the Catholic religion that was also hammered into our heads from childhood, a passport to heaven. The most picturesque part of all this was the cold switching, which made us leap in one phrase from the cultural universe of our daily lives to the transcultural universe of our education. The word rags we had to create responded in most cases to a desperate search for concepts that would reflect the ever-changing reality of our newly acquired habits and tastes and the vertiginous modernity of our newfound aspirations. Saying, for instance, my date sounded much more modern than saying my fiancé, a word that reeked of chaperones and engagement rings. And when we had to tackle thorny subjects like sex, it was, it was much more civilized to speak of a French kiss than to use the less subtle Spanish expression, peso de lengua, tongue kiss, which sounded so very gross. <laughs> and who would not prefer to be called a square or a nerd than to be mortally wounded by such a strong insult as our own offensive, I debo. <laughs> it was evident that the times of the Spanish Empire, in which our parents still wanted to keep us children, were now definitely a thing of the past. There were, of course, small crevices in the process of linguistic and cultural colonization we were undergoing. Even those fervent, ver excuse me, even those fervent missionaries of American civilization that were the Dominican nuns in my school could not control every single detail. Their Irish-American nationalism <coughs> would unexpectedly barge in unrestrained each year on the 17th day of March, when they would make us wear shamrocks on our shirts and sing the whole repertory of patriotic English ballads. And although they did everything that they possibly could to smother our own Puerto Rican nationalism, they also made us vibrate with anti-British passion while we sang with tears in our eyes. And the strangers came and tried to teach us their ways and scorned us just for being what we are. But they might as well go chasing after moonbeams or light up any candle 
from the star. That's a Galway Bay an Irish a patriotic ballad, which I love. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's where we leave this and go on to the last part. Your generation is coming soon. <laughs> the last part is called, How Does It Feel to Be and to Have a Colonial Problem? Daydreaming Before the Liberty Bell. Okay. We have come to the end of this reading. The testimonial essay I will now read from <laughs> is from my latest book, Mirada de Doble Filo. A little promotion right here. <laughs> Mirada de Doble Filo, which hasn't yet been translated into English. Professor Andrew Hurley was kind enough to translate the piece for this special occasion. He tells the story of my trip to Philadelphia, where I paid a visit to a cherished symbol of American independence, the Liberty Bell. The visit, of course, serves as a pretext for a brief meditation on both American and Puerto Rican history, and I believe it might be a fitting conclusion to my literary dialogue with W.E.P. Du Bois. The dualism, the tunes that Du Bois so sharply detected in the lives and minds of black Americans is also the perceptual dichotomy of the conquered and oppressed peoples of the world. It is here gently confronted with its counterpart, the dualism of the conquering colonialist mentality. I beg your permission to read this last text in Spanish and hope you will allow me that small privilege. And an English version is available Circulating uh, uh, for those uh, who do not understand Spanish because I do not want you to feel left out. I now leave you to savor the sweet music of my native language and I briefly present the colonial case of Puerto Rico to a hopefully sympathetic liberty bell. Okay, you have to give us a second to come out. <laughs> Professor Hurley translated the text especially for this occasion. He took some liberties with the text, but I, I approve some of them. <laughs> the title is good, Here's to the Liberty Bell, because in Spanish it's called Ante la Campana de la Libertad, before the standing in front of the Liberty Bell. But in English it's better, Here's to the Liberty Bell, because it's a toast. Okay. I celebrate the bell and I ask the bell to consider our case. Okay. Estando en Filadelfia una tarde, decidí llegarme hasta la calle Chesna para echarle un vistazo a los símbolos nacionales de los Estados Unidos de América. El más impresionante de ellos es la campana de la libertad, guardada celosamente en una capilla de cristal a solo pasos del ayuntamiento donde se firmara en 1776 la declaración de independencia. Una multitud impaciente esperaba su turno al entrar. Me sentía algo incómoda, no tanto por los indiscretos empujones recibidos en la fila, como por la discreta batalla campal que libraban mi conciencia y mi curiosidad. Me estaba un tanto contradictoria la posición de turista colonial, rindiendo pleitesía a la epopeya independentista del país que ha dominado al suyo durante más de un siglo. Todavía más contradictoria se me antojaba la de la nación que había inaugurado la lucha antiimperialista en nuestro hemisferio para finalmente convertirse en campeón, campeón mundial del colonialismo. <coughs> Entre la siguiente veintena de escogidos pasó al fin esta servidora. Disciplinadamente desfilamos todos hacia el altar sobre el que reinaba la gran campana iluminada. Experimenté el delicioso escalofrío que siempre me producen los ritos solemnes de la humanidad. Como para reforzar las paradojas, un joven guía negro tenía a su cargo la presentación. Lo primero que hizo fue mostrarnos con gesto ampuloso la increíble grieta del bronce venerado. Sí, señores, tal y como lo leen, la campana de la libertad está y siempre estuvo, desde sus orígenes mismos, profundamente agrietada. Lo profético del signo me dejó debidamente sobrecogida. Nuestro sonriente mentor procedió a formular la tesis que sostendría a lo largo de su exposición que aquella venerable campana no era ya un símbolo exclusivo de la independencia americana, 
sino más bien un instrumento al servicio de toda lucha libertaria. Nos explicó a continuación que tras haber cumplido con su misión original, se había cogido unas merecidas vacaciones. En el siglo XIX, cuando la esclavitud estaba en su apogeo, los abolicionistas le habían dado razones para volver a cantar. La campana había tocado nuevamente para las sufragistas, aquellas bravas mujeres que reclamaban justicia electoral en las primeras décadas del siglo XX. Ya más cerca de nuestra época, recurrieron a sus buenos oficios los adversarios de la odiosa guerra de Vietnam. Tampoco los militantes de la causa de los derechos civiles se quedaron sin oír la réplica. Durante la presentación del día, yo observaba la actitud reverente con la que algunos turistas americanos escuchaban el honroso resumen de su campana. La satisfacción que estiraba sus labios, la atención que encendía sus ojos, todo aquello me provocaba algo así como una vaga envidia mechada de ternura y de rabia. Ternura porque la expresión humana del amor a la patria conmueve. Rabia porque la doble vara usada por los imperios para medir el patriotismo propio y el ajeno desafía la comprensión. ¿A saber de qué es ese sentimiento una virtud de los Estados Unidos y un delito en Puerto Rico? ¿Con qué derecho pueden los americanos disfrutar impunemente de un orgullo que su país se ha dedicado tan sistemáticamente a criminalizar, perseguir y sofocar en el mío? Asaltada por las interrogantes, yo insistía en mi mudo debate. En respuesta, los rostros enrejados de nuestros presos políticos se asomaban a mi memoria. ¿Qué diferencia real existe, mirándolo bien, entre los Sons of Liberty de la Revolución Americana y los nacionalistas puertorriqueños? Ninguna que no sea la victoria de los primeros y la derrota de los segundos. Digan lo que digan los que la transcriben, la historia lleva siempre la firma de los vencedores. Aquellos que una vez impusieron por la fuerza de las armas sus agendas sediciosas son ahora objeto de culto de los países donde prevalecieron sus causas. En cambio, la mala fe política tilda de locos, ilusos o terroristas a quienes en otras latitudes han luchado por ideales similares sin lograr alcanzarlos. Sabotear la mercancía británica, cubrir de brea y plumas a los funcionarios ingleses de las 13 colonias americanas, Disparar contra las tropas leales al rey de Inglaterra fueron en su época actos subversivos severamente condenados. ¿Quién contradice hoy la horonda unanimidad que celebra cada 4 de julio entre paradas y petardos esos mismos atentados? Un aplauso resonante vino a interrumpir mi monólogo interior. A punto de saludar estaba cuando descubrí que la ovación marcaba el final de la explicación del guía. Atrapada en mis obsesiones atávicas, acababa de perderme. El relampagueo de las cámaras inauguró la inevitable tanda de retratos para el álbum. Por aquello de practicar la famosa hospitalidad de la ciudad del amor fraternal, al día le dio con entrevistar a los presentes. Salvo dos o tres europeos, alguno que otro asiático y yo, los visitantes eran todos americanos. ¿Y usted? ¿De dónde es? Tan distraída andaba que la pregunta me agarró desprevenida. Y así, sin maldad ni alevosía, cedí al travieso impulso de contestar Puerto Rico, campanada pendiente. <risa> Un silencio diplomático invadió la capilla. Mis ojos se citaron por los del guía. No sé si la chispa que vi en ellos fue un engaño de la emoción. Lo cierto es que apuntando triunfalmente hacia la campana de la libertad, mi aliado americano anunció con elegancia suprema Damas y caballeros, someto el caso. <risa>
thousand questions. I have no, no question. Everything is clear. <laughs> Writers are also political beings in the Caribbean and Latin America, so they are very much also uh, social critics as well as literary writers. So uh, any field that. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that you know about Toys and Souls Black Book, of course, all of us work in these hand racial attitudes. One of the things it does is point out the richness of culture and seeing what we've done with it today. Of course, deep Christian support of culture would resist the colonizing impulse. independentista y hay otro integracionista Ajá, te, estadista. te estoy preguntando el, si nos cuentas un poco Of the United States and colonialism 
has had an impact that would make it a very different organization for men and women in Puerto Rico or Yes, so that's a very interesting point because it has, it has often been uh, pointed out that uh, the American presence in Puerto Rico was favorable to the uh, women's liberation movement. It was, uh, it was a colonialist presence, but it was favorable to that movement because of the struggles of women in the United States. Uh, when uh, women had their vote in the states, uh, Puerto Rican women had it also before uh, all the rest of the women in Latin America, before even French women who had it in, in 1948, incredible, in the country of human rights. So uh, um, the American influence was uh, very positive in that sense. Because I have I have only spoken of the bad part, but there are many good parts too. Like civil civil rights legislation too has been uh, good in Puerto Rico. To, has given rights to to uh, uh, Puerto Rican blacks who were left out during the Spanish era, etc. And just a short follow up: Does that have any implications then for relations between men and women in Puerto Rico? I'm thinking here that it could be that because women. Uh, would uh, seem not maybe uh, marginalized. Mm -hmm. Is it the case then that uh, women are seen as more representing the colonizing power, uh, whereas men might be seen as more um, victimized by the colonial power? Does that create a conflict between men and women? I don't think so, I mean, you know, not really consciously, but uh, it has an effect, an, an, an effect on politics, on electoral politics, because uh, a study has been made that uh, women are more favorable to the state party, and blacks too, because they believe that their rights are tied to uh, American uh, politics. Yes. Oh. Spanish. 
Because that was a private Catholic school in English, an, an American school, but then I had to study in Spanish. And when I got to the university, it was difficult for me, even though I was fluent in Spanish because it's the language I speak, I found it hard to uh, manage an intellectual language in Spanish because I had learned it all in English. Even the names of foreign countries, sometimes I have to look up in the dictionary in Spanish because I learned them in English. And when I got to the university, at the university, there was a meeting of, of <coughs> students from the private schools that had learned in English and the public school students that had studied in Spanish ever since 1948, the language of the UK, public education was Spanish. So at the university, we met the rest of the Puerto Ricans who had studied in Spanish. And that was, a, that was great. That was a, a very satisfying experience because there we learned we started to begin to appreciate the intellectual Spanish that we had been deprived of in school. And it was then also that I discovered my own country, because at the University of Puerto Rico, there, in the 60s where I, where I studied, there was a lot of dissident thought. It was the era, in the States too, it was like that. And uh, I was forced to find out about the colonial situation of Puerto Rico, which I had blissfully ignored until then. And then, then uh, the real existential anguish. <laughs> but it was that way that I recuperated my intellectual standard. But I also must say that I had the great, great luck of having a father who, did, who never went to school, but what was a, a poet in Spanish, an oral <coughs> poet. In Puerto Rico, we have oral poetry and written poetry. And the oral poetry is called improvisaciones. And uh, 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 there's an improvised, uh, uh, an activity for improvising verses in Spanish. And the people in the countryside are very good at that. My father came out of that. And he maintained in me that, that uh, taste for literary Spanish that he had, even though we had not gone to school. Mm -hmm. 
one more question or comment? Students have the right idea, right? Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, going back to the term of like New Year weekends and all that, um, I was wondering, I saw today, um, <coughs> our parents um, trying to make their children embrace that their culture, Spanish culture, and like, the language and even that. Or are they more, um, are they more into English and like the New York um, culture? Yeah, I mean, of New York for Puerto Ricans in the States or Puerto Ricans in the island? Because it's all oh, Puerto Ricans in the States. Yeah. I hear, because that is not my experience. I'm an island Puerto Rican, but I hear from my friends and acquaintances of Puerto Ricans who live <coughs> in the mainland that you have both things. Uh, some Puerto Ricans affirm their culture and even mythify Puerto Rico. They, they idealize it uh, to the point of, of, of that, is, that it is negative for them, because they believe it is the ideal island of paradise that they were forced to meet by those wicked parents, etc. But uh, there is also the other side that wants to assimilate in order not to have problems caused by racism and rejection. So you have both things. And in the island, finally, you have both things too, because you have the majority of people who want to affirm their culture and be Puerto Ricans, but you also have those who believe that it is only in statehood that our <coughs> colonial problem will be resolved, and then they favor uh, the teaching of English and English only and that sort of thing. But it's all it's, it's all the struggle for political rights. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you yeah. the reputation of the New York Wiki Public Charge? The Pedro Pietri, the Bill Aldrin. I love them. I love them. Uh, you know, do they have influence in Puerto Rico? Because they're very angry and very sarcastic mm -hmm. and very conscious of race. Do they have, you know, they less considered less innocent? Okay, good question. They were discovered late because in Puerto Rico, because of the fact that English had been imposed as the language of education until 1948, there was a collective rejection of, of English in the sense that it was imposed. But uh, when Puerto Rican migration went on, and there was a second generation of Puerto Ricans born in the state whose native language was English, even though they spoke Spanish too, etc. They, they were English speaking. So at first, those poets were ignored and not considered to be within the Puerto Rican tradition. They, uh, the critics over there said, no, those are American poets. But the problem is that in the States, they were not accepted as American poets either. So they were in between. Then, with uh, renewed migration, now is a moment where Puerto Ricans are migrating a lot. Middle class Puerto Ricans this time, not the poor classes. The middle class Puerto Ricans migrating to Florida in search of jobs because of the economy. Uh, renewed migration has, has created more relationship between Puerto Ricans here and there. They call it now a revolving door migration. So now, those poets are understood and, and liked and read, while before they were not. So conditions, economical and political conditions, have created uh, a, better, a better climate for their appreciation. But they are the very radical poets. Pedro Pietri, for example. I love him. I think he's the best one. He died recently. <laughs> Racism that is not 
confess to. That is, uh, I think, inherited from the colonial plantation times. But uh, there are many black Puerto Ricans and, and, and mixed Puerto Ricans, so with the younger generations, it is getting uh, more and more, it's getting better. It's not the same type of racism as in the States. For example, there was, there is no, there was no segregation, like restaurants for the black and the, and the white. Not that kind of racism. Just kind of a subtle uh, difference making. But there is. Let's not deny it. Thank you very much.